Good. Good. Hope you guys are having a good summer. Uh, everybody having a good summer? Yes. Anybody want it to be over? No. That's a pretty good answer. I saw one hand up there. I'm somewhere in the middle. I love summertime, but it's been so busy that I look forward to maybe things sewing down. Obviously, the house getting sold and purchased, that'll be nice, but hope you're having a good thing. You're here. Um, I want to talk about the carnival real quickly. Christian talked about it. Jesse talked about it. But the carnival is a great opportunity for us to connect in the community. And uh, we put a lot of effort into it. We think it's a great uh, event, honestly. Last week, we are not last week, but last year, we had the Stone family come out, just come out to the carnival. I don't think they were looking at necessarily making this their home church, but they came out here and they had such a positive experience that they've now made this their home church, amen? And so that's what we want to do. And we want to invite others. The other thing that's great for is reconnecting. People get busy over the summer. We get in and out of habits, good habits or bad habits. And a lot of people over the summertime, church attendance drops a little bit, they get busy. And it's a great way in the fall time to reconnect and get them plugged back in. Here's how you can help with that. We've been trying to advertise. We've been trying to promote it. Usually we go into Facebook. We use a church credit card. and We pay and we try to reach people that don't go to church. Uh, For some reason this year, it's not working. We can't seem to get it to work. Facebook's been stupid, etc. But maybe this is a good thing because it'll save us money and we have a way to advertise for free. And that's you guys. And so here's what we're asking you to do. One, click going on the event. Don't click interested. Some people say, well, I am going, of course. But no, don't just click interested. Click going to share the event. And the final thing is that you go into the invite button like Christian showed there, and you have hundreds and hundreds of friends, right? You know, right? You guys got any friends? Yes. Do I have to have you guys stand up, do some jumping jacks, wake up, get the blood flowing this morning? You all got hundreds of friends on your friends list. Invite them. you do that for us? Yes. Okay, so... Um, the disciples that followed Jesus. Do you know how the end of their life ended? Not well. Most of them died. They were beaten for their faith. Jesus said, you have to lose your life, right? I'm not even asking you to do that. I'm asking you. Everybody put your hand up in the air like this with one finger. Can you do this? Put your hands up. Get your hands up, everybody. Do this. Okay, can you do this? Okay, was that, was that hard? Was that painful? Can you do that for Jesus? Can you click that you're going and invite your friends? Thank you. So, uh, Another thing we want to talk about real quickly is uh, if you're a part of the process, if you helped out, thank you. Friday we had a wedding. Makai and Danielle got married. Obviously, they're not here this weekend. Amen. It was beautiful. And so that was awesome. And, of course, September 1st, they're going to celebrate with the church family. I think right after church, they have a reception. So, so that's where the Eastie family is. So it's been a good week, been busy. But let's get into God's Word and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, I would just pray. Father, I would ask and I would plead with you in the name of your son, Jesus, that we would not go through the motions, that your word would penetrate deep into our hearts. Father, I pray for a revival in this nation. And yet, Father, revival begins in our own hearts. Begin to stir up in us a deep love for you, a love for your word, and a love for the lost. Remove the distractions. And Father, help us to see the personal application of this. And Lord, help us to have a love for others that we may contend for the Christian faith that you intend. The only thing that can save the nation, the only hope is your son, Jesus Christ. We want to bring that hope to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, there's a verse in the Bible where it says, Arise from your sleep and God will give you life. He's this metaphor of saying, hey, you're sleeping, it's time to wake up. And did you know that in the New Testament, when he says that, they re-quote it from the Old Testament, when he's saying, hey, you're asleep, you need to wake up, do you know who he writes it to? Christians. You know, and because if we're honest, at times we can get a little sleepy in our faith, a little lackadaisical, a little lukewarm, a little complacent, right? And, and we want to make sure that that's not us. And, I, and I've been there, where, you know, you can go through the motion, but let's not do that, because I think a lot's... Standing, there's a lot online right now. There's a lot of people that are lost, and, and we want to make a difference. I want to make sure that you guys are right with Jesus and other people. So it's time to wake up. Can we wake up, everybody? Yes. So last week we started um, in the book of Jude. Now this week's going to be a little bit different. We're going to be in Jude, but it's going to feel more like a teaching than it is preaching. And so I hope that you guys can track on this a little bit. Now last week we started in Jude, and we're in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And what we really looked at was this text. It says, Beloved, I was diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. And so last week, that's kind of what we really focused on. And the message was contending for the Christian faith. We looked at who's supposed to be the one contending. Is it pastors, evangelists, the paid ministry staff? Who's the one? And we looked at that. What he's referring to is that every single Christian... 
I mean that if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, that God is calling you to contend for the faith. Then we looked at, okay, who are we contending with? Hey, who is this we're supposed to go contend with? Is it supposed to be the world, we ask? Is it liberals, the Illuminati, political parties? Is it other religions? Maybe it's secular educational or media that's ungodly. And we looked at the letter, and what we found is, no, that's not what he's referring to. The ones that we're contending with are people that have penetrated the church who call themselves Christian, but are teaching and doing things that are not Christ-like. And so that's where our primary battle is, because that's where, you know, by the way, you know the teaching on lukewarm? Jesus says, uh, you're neither hot or cold, you're rather lukewarm. I'd, I'd rather be hot or cold. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. And what he's saying there, he's saying, I'd rather you be on fire for me or not even believe in me. Here's why, because an unbeliever doesn't misrepresent God at all. An unbeliever is not confusing people about Christianity. But what can be confusing about Christianity when somebody says, I'm a Christian, but they're not living out their face, God's saying it'd be better for you not to even claim to know me. And that teaches all the way through Scripture. So where we have to begin to contend is fight is within the church body, within those believers, making sure that we are representing Christianity properly. And what do we contend with? Well, we talked about the Bible. Truth. That's what we contend with. It says the truth will set you free. And we look specifically at what was compromised, the lie that had to be exposed. And Jude said this, that ungodly and condemned people have crept into the church unnoticed. And this one gets me all the time. He said they're going to get into the church unnoticed. He's saying you're not going to notice it. And I hear a lot of Christians say, no, I'll notice it. I'm discerning. I'm wise. I've been to church. I read my Bible. No, he just said it's going to happen unnoticed, and it happens all the time unnoticed. We've had people creep into this church that have taught and done things that are unbiblical. Have you known that? And it happened unnoticed. So it says they'll creep in unnoticed who turn the grace of God into lewd living and they deny Jesus Christ. Basically, they use grace as an excuse to justify sinning. They're like, well, because of grace, I'm saved by grace, I can live kind of however I want. Now, I mentioned this last week, but the Bible warns against this abuse many, many times. It calls it a false teaching. And yet, even though the Bible teaches about it quite often, it's prevalent in American Christianity. Did you know that? It might go by different names. Sometimes it's done inadvertently or accidentally. Sometimes people will do it because they don't realize or maybe they don't have a proper biblical foundation. But it's happening a lot in Christianity in America. Sometimes it happens inadvertently as, as maybe it's not necessarily that they condone sin, but they downplay it or they avoid teaching certain truths from the Bible. I'll give you an example. This is one of the ways that sometimes it can happen inadvertently. Um, a teacher who maybe uh, wants to grow his church, and have lots of crowds, he wants to be positive, because if you start talking about sin or repentance, people don't want to hear that. That's not uplifting. So let's say they're going through the Noah story. Y'all familiar with the story of Noah? So when they teach Noah, they might look at that and they'll focus on things like, you know, God's provision during hard times. And look at how he was there and he gave him an ark. Or he might talk about the animals and the life and all these sort of things, which are part of the story. But that's not what the story is about, is it? The story is about the fact that God was tired of mankind's sin and depravity and he was judging the earth. But a teacher like that will never go there because that's not uplifting. But he's avoiding the very reason why this story happened. So they'll do stuff like that. So whether it's direct or inadvertent, they avoid talking about sin. I would say this, that the unbiblical teaching, the misunderstanding of grace is embraced by more people than the proper biblical teaching of grace. It really is. There's way more people called Christian that misunderstand this teaching. And I guarantee you, um, I know most of you pretty well, and I think you're pretty solid biblically. And so this may not apply to your personal lives, but I guarantee you this, that there's somebody in your life right now who calls themselves a Christian who falsely believes this. So I would encourage you to take it to heart. Please be ready to contend for these truths. People need us to do this. Souls are at stake. And so now to this week, Jude's going to go deeper after what he said last week. He's going to go deeper, and he's going to emphasize and leave us no doubt what he means and who this applies to. But before we get into that part of Jude and the next few verses we're going to cover, I think there's something important that we have to identify. Something that happens often that causes us to misinterpret Scripture to people's demise and detriment. And what that is is this. We have to always make sure that we use proper interpretation principles. 
Because if you're reading the Bible and you're not interpreting it properly, it's going to lead you down a really unhealthy path. So make sure your principles are proper. And the, what we're talking about is exegesis versus eisegesis. And exegesis is the proper principle. It involves analyzing the text based on the original context and the intent and letting that shape your belief system. Eisegesis is this. It's the incorrect principle, and it's when people read into the text preconceived ideas, biases, or notions. Meaning that they pick up the Bible and they're already looking for it to affirm what they want it to say. And that can cause you really bad belief systems, really bad biblical understanding. I'll give you an example. So um, I did this last night. Uh, so are you guys familiar with the term, uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Calvinism or Meninism. Raise your hand. Are you familiar with the, the conversation, can you lose your salvation or not lose your salvation? Has anybody ever heard that, discussed it, or whatever? Raise your hand if you're familiar. If you fall into one of those two camps, if you're a Calvinist, Armenian, if you think you can lose your salvation or can't lose your salvation, here's what it's going to do. It's probably going to cause you to have an improper interpretation of the Bible. You'll start to have eisegesis. You're going to let your preconceived idea of that concept incorrectly interpret text. I'll give you an example. If you're somebody who grew up in a church that were taught that Calvinism is true and you can't lose your salvation, and then you start to read a text that would seem to indicate maybe you could, here's what you'll do. You'll say, well, I already know you can't lose your salvation, so that can't mean what it says. It has to mean something different, and you start to reinterpret it. The opposite can be true. If you grew up in a church that taught you can lose your salvation, but now you begin to read a text that seems to indicate that you can't, that you're God's child and you will never lose your soul, then you'll read a text and you'll think, well, that one seems to say the opposite. It certainly can't mean that because I know. And so you'll reinterpret it. It's really hard to do, but when you read the Bible, you have to make sure to get all your biases out of the way, whatever you think that you know, whatever maybe you were taught, and you've got to let the text speak to you as far as what it's saying. Because if you won't do that, it's really unhealthy. And here's another thing, by the way. Do you know, can, can you guys tell me where in the Bible it talks about Calvinism and Armenianism? It doesn't. Because it was created by men. God doesn't address that. So don't read scriptures with that preconceived mindset. So now let's get to Jude. Last week we looked at verses 1 through 4, which he says, fight for truth, fight or contend for our Christian faith. And now in verses 5 through 7, he's going to begin to understand the resistance to his argument. He anticipates these arguments, and he's going to begin to answer them, very much like the Puritans did. Did you know how the Puritans used to preach? When they preached back in the day, and their sermons were really long, you think that mine are long, and they would go for an hour, hour and a half. And so what they would do is they would preach the, the affirmative of the text. They would say, hey, this is what the text is teaching. But then they would anticipate the arguments of like, well, what about this or what about that verses or how does that make sense? So they would do the affirmative, and then they would begin to teach on the possible arguments against so they could make sure that they were balanced. And this is what Jude's about to do right here. He knows that there's going to be some arguments in their mindset. Things like this. Like, well, hey, Jude, you're talking about sin and not sinning, but aren't we saved by faith? And isn't sin what you do or don't do? Isn't that a work? Or they might think this is like, well, okay, you're talking about sin, but who's perfect? Because none of, can any of us, by the way, are any of you perfect that never sin? No. No. Like we still have sin. So the argument is, wait a second, you're talking about sin, yet we all sin. Or the idea of like, okay, how much is too much sin? If we all sin, where's that line where I sin, but I'm covered by the blood of Jesus? Or my sin shows that maybe I'm not a child of God? Or the argument of, wait a second, once I'm God's child, he's not going to let me be lost. Or the other thinking that Jude addresses is that, okay, maybe Jude's writing people that are not Christians. They never were to begin with. So he's anticipating these mindsets. And so now he's going to go deeper with some more biblical examples to really get them to understand what he's getting at. And all those excuses that I use, by the way, they're human understanding, they're human reasoning. And they're devoid of scripture. And here's why I say that. You can talk to people that can make really good arguments. They say things that sound so logical and they sound so good and they feel right. But here's what I would always say is like, that sounds really good, but can you give me the scriptures with that? And if you can't, if they can't tell you what the Bible verses are to support what they just said, then it doesn't hold any value. 
So let's get to today's teaching. Jude said this last week and then verse 5 through 7. Christians contend earnestly for the Christian faith because certain people have crept into the church unnoticed, condemned an ungodly people, who use grace to live lewd, sinful lives and in the process deny Jesus Christ. Now to today's verses. But I want to remind you, although you once knew this, that God, having saved people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for judgment on the great day. And Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them in similar manner, given themselves over to sexual morality and gone after strange fleshly desires, set forth as an example to others, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So last week he says, hey, you need to contend for the faith. And now he's giving them more stuff to understand what he's referring to. Now for clarity, um, in this same letter later on, he says this. He says, the people that do this, they are spots and blemishes in your love feast. They feast with you without fear of judgment. So if you weren't sure who Jews are referring to later on, we're going to get to that. But he's saying, hey, these people are part of your love feast, what he's referring to is that they take communion with you. They feast with you. They're in fellowship. They're at your church potluck. That's what he's referring to. So if you weren't sure if he was talking to the church and about people that were calling themselves Christians, it's very clear that's what he's referring to. He's like, when you gather as a church and you're having your feast together, they're there with you. And then Jude states this. He says, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, So here's the other thing. They've been taught this before, and he's reiterating it by saying you. And who's he writing to again? He's writing to Christians. So he's reiterating. He's making it really clear here. And then Jude uses a teaching from the Old Testament saying, remember the Lord having saved his people out of Egypt. So God's writing about God's people. So here's what Jude's doing. He's writing to God's people about God's people. And he's using past judgment on God's people as a warning to New Testament Christians. Everything that we're going to read today are scriptures out of the New Testament. So he's writing to God's people, about God's people, as a warning. Now, Jude said this, that God took these people out of Egypt. You know that, his his people, the Israelites. He said, but afterward he destroyed those who did not believe. So what does he mean by that? That they didn't believe. Well, Paul actually uses the exact same reference in Hebrews. So we're going to look at Hebrews because looking at Hebrews will help you understand further what Jude's getting at, what he's referring to. So we're going to go ahead and read that. And here's what Paul says, Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. He states, Christ is a son over God's own house, whose house we belong to if we hold fast the confidence of hope firm to the end. Well, he starts right there by saying what we, okay, belong to God's house if we continue. Yeah, I'll, I'll click that through. I'll take care of the, the part. Yeah, I'll, I'll take care of that. So, yeah, that's right. Um, so he's saying right here, if. He's saying that we belong to God's house if we continue to hold our confidence to the end. What's interesting about that word if, it means on condition that, and in this text five times the word comes up. If you do this, if you continue, if you abide. So he's given us a condition. And he continues. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts as the day of rebellion and trial in the wilderness, where your ancestor tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. I was angry at that generation, said they always go astray in their hearts. So he's describing these people that he had saved out of Egypt. But he said, but they went astray. Here's the thing about the word astray. It means to move away from the correct path or direction, meaning they were on the correct path. They were doing it right. They were falling after God. So these are not, once again, unbelievers that were never saved. These were people that were doing the right thing, and then they go astray. And then Paul continues. So God swore in his wrath, they will not enter my rest. Beware, brethren. Once again, who are brethren? Christians, yep, believers. He said, brethren, beware, lest there be any of you 
with an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. So he's saying, hey, you have to be careful so you don't depart from God. And you can't depart from something if you weren't there at some point. So he's saying, hey, it's possible to depart from the living God. And Paul continues. He says, exhort one another daily, well, it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Well, he said, today, if you will hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as they did in the day of rebellion. Who, having heard, they rebelled. Indeed, was not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now, with who God was angry for 40 years, was it not those who sinned, who corpses fell in the wilderness? And to who did he swear that he would not enter the rest, but those who did not obey? We see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Therefore, since the promise remains of entering God's rest, let us fear lest we fall short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to them as well as to us. And I'm going to stop right there because the argument often is, and I've heard people that have tried to use this as an excuse to say, well, yeah, that's the Old Testament. They didn't have the gospel, but we do have the gospel. But he just said right here is they actually had the gospel preached to them as well as to us. Did you read that? They heard the gospel. Now, they may not have understood it exactly the way we do. We got to see Christ die and rise again, so we see it a lot more clearly. But he said that they heard the gospel. He said, but it doesn't profit them because it was not mixed, I'm sorry, it was not mixed with faith. He said, therefore, it remains that some must enter it. And those who his first preached did not enter because of disobedience. And God designates a certain day, saying, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's be diligent to enter that rest, lest Anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So Paul is using the same argument as Jude. He's saying, hey, look back to the Old Testament, and he's talking to New Testament Christians. But here's what's a little bit confusing. Because what he does, he lists three reasons why they didn't make it in. And they are disobedience, sin, and unbelief. And people that want to get around this text, what they'll do is just just focus on the unbelief portion. There's a church in town that does this. and They call it the Duluth Bible Church, and they basically say all you have to do is believe is anything else is works, and it doesn't matter, and you don't have to do it. So they'd say, well, it's just a matter of belief. So they kind of reduce it down to this idea is that it's just unbelief, so as long as you believe God exists, you're good. So that's kind of what they teach. But I want to say this. He lists all three. It may sound confusion, but there's not a contradiction. They all fit together. If you focus just on one part of that or ignore the other parts, you reject the whole teaching. Let's ask this question. When he's referring to these people that came out of Egypt, when it talks about the fact that they didn't believe, was it that they didn't believe in God? It said right there that they saw his works for 40 years. And by the way, what they saw was amazing. They saw a fire by night, a cloud by day. They got fed with manna. Isn't that crazy? It says that the sea, the Red Sea parted. I'm sorry, but could you imagine if you went down to Lake Superior and God said, I'm going to part the whole lake? I'm telling you what, that would be quite amazing. They were spared. It says their clothes didn't age for 40 years. It never wore out. They saw water come out of rocks. Miracle after miracle. In fact, during trials and tribulations, when they cried out in prayer, who did they pray to? They prayed to God. So, of course, they knew God existed. They believed in him. So, unbelief about what? It wasn't about the existence of God. Here's it. They believed in God's existence, but they didn't believe God's warnings about rebellion and about willful sin that led to disobedience leading to sin, which ultimately led them to death and being separated from God. So, yes, it was all three. It was unbelief. They didn't take seriously God's warnings about sin. It led to disobedience and it led to sin. And they are interconnected. And Jude's trying to get these people to take the warning seriously. And it's not just Jude. Paul does it and Peter does it. And by the way, when God repeats something in Scripture over and over and over and uses the exact same thing, it's a wake-up call for us to really get our attention. Jude said this, that God destroyed those in the Old Testament, and he said, as an example for others in the future. He's saying that whole thing happened as an example to us. That refers for us. He's like, I did that for you guys so you would have an example of how you should live and not live. 
In fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, here's what Paul said, and he also shares the exact same teaching. He says, For God's people that left Egypt, they drank the same spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Jesus Christ. That's another one. Some would argue that, well, they didn't really have Jesus. You know, not to the extent that we did, but it says right there that actually they had Jesus Christ in some form or fashion. With most of them, God was not pleased. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples. He's saying they were examples to Christians, to New Testament believers, with the intent that we should not lust after the evil things they lusted for. They became idolaters. They had immoral partying. They committed sexual morality. They complained, and they were destroyed. And these things happened to them as examples to us They were written for our admonition, for warning. And then it says this, Therefore him who thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. You know, our God is so good. You're here today because of God. God will preserve you. God will keep you. But there also has to be humility. When I used to work at Teen Challenge, I remember sometimes guys would say to me, like, now that I'm set free, I'll never use again. I'm good. And I always think, man, that's really concerning. Because here's what I know, my God is good and my God is faithful, but I also realize the human nature. And that without Jesus, my own nature is ugly and it can rise up. And so it should create a humility to say, hey, even though I'm doing well now and God's preserved me and God's good, I have to keep my eyes on him because if I don't, if I drift or I do something where that relationship becomes severed or strained, I know that the old me can come out. So it creates a humility. That's why Paul is saying, hey, that for you have to be careful if you think that you're standing lest you fall. He's saying, be humble. Don't be arrogant. Don't be prideful. Don't think, man, I'm a Christian. I've got this. I'll figure it out. I'm fine. Peter uses the same warnings to false teachers. And he argues very similarly, almost identical references, almost identical examples as Jude and Paul. So the Bible is very consistent and there's no confusion. So here's what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2, writing to the church and warning us about these false teachers. He said, there were false prophets among God's people in the Old Testament. Even there will be false teachers in the church now. They will secretly bring in destructive teachings and deny the Lord who died for them and bring destruction on themselves. So Peter's saying, hey, these false teachers are going to come in. Just like Jude had said. Just like Paul warns. And he's going to get into what they're teaching and what he's about to tell us is that they're false teaching like it's okay to sin. It's okay to live however you want because you're saved by grace. Peter continues, he says, and many people will follow their destructive ways. These false teachers, he's saying a lot of people will follow them. Not a couple, not somebody here and there, many. I believe that we're seeing that today in American Christianity. Many people are following this. He goes on to say, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. He's describing hypocrisy. What's one of the biggest reasons why people don't want to come to church that are non-Christians? hypocrisy. So what he's saying is that they're going around teaching Christians, like you can live and do whatever you want. So then those Christians go, well, I'd say, I'm a Christian, but they're still cruel to their family. They mistreat their wife. They're selfish. They're drunk. Whatever it might be, they're doing things that are immoral. And the world's seeing that, saying, man, if that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with that. So not only is it hurting the people that are living that way, but it's hurting the Christian witness. And here's how they do it. He says that they they deceive people By using personal desires and by lust, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment's not idle and their destruction does not slumber. Here's what he's saying that they do. He's saying that they know that you have personal desires. You know, our flesh wants us to do things that are unhealthy, right? I don't know about you, but my flesh still rises up. He says, so that's what they do. They know that you have desires. They know your lust. They know your flesh. And they exploit that. They come alongside and they say, it's okay. It's fine. And they take you exactly where your flesh wants to go. Right? That's what they do. And they know that you're going to love, you're going to love them for it. You're going to think they're great. You're going to become friends. It's going to feel exactly what you want to hear. It's going to be beautiful. And they use that. In fact, it says in 2 Timothy that people in the end times will gather people around them that tell them what they want to hear. It may not be truthful, it may not be good for them, but that's what I want to hear. Tell me I'm fine, tell me I don't have to change, tell me everything's great, tell God loves me just as I am. And so that's what they do. 
like the false prophets of the Old Testament. They say things like, don't worry about sin. Jesus died for it. I'll give you an example. I shared this last night. It wasn't in my notes, but I've shared this before. I wasn't a Christian. I get saved in my early 20s. And I'm going to shock you with something. Um, I looked at porn, right? And uh, like 97% of our society. So um, somebody's like, I can't believe it. Stop it. You know, most people unfortunately do. So, um, so I looked at porn. And uh, you know what? I don't think I was addicted. I love my wife. But I just did it because that's what you do, right? I didn't think anything about sin. So then early in my faith, um, I started to feel a little guilty. The Holy Spirit was convicting me. And I'm like, I shouldn't do that. And so then I, 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 I'd stop for a bit, but then I would do it, and then I'd feel really crappy. By the way, you ever feel crappy when you sin? Anybody? Just feel terrible? Yeah. Um, that's the Holy Spirit loving you, not trying to harm you. He's trying to change your life for better. But I would do that, and I'd feel really guilty. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do it again. And then, you know, a month later, I might do it again and feel guilty. Now, here's what happened. I had people in my life that were Christians, or they said they were Christians. They were trying to be nice to me, but they would say this. Don't worry about it. God loves you. It's okay. He died for your sin. You're only human. And so you know what that allowed me to do? Keep doing it. But then I did this one time. I stopped listening to what everybody said, and I started to read God's word. And what I quickly found out is what God's word said was not lining up with what they were saying. What God's word was telling me is that if I habitually, willfully, and unrepentantly, and I say that because we all have sin, right? But, you know, it was unrepentant, it was willful and habitual, that actually might show that I wasn't a child of God. And then you know what happened? I got serious with and got set free. Amen? Amen. And this is what these people do, though. They just tell you, like, it's okay. It's fine. Don't feel bad. And then he continues. For God not spare the angels who sin and cast them down to hell and chains of darkness reserved for judgment. He not spare the ancient world, but save Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Bring the flood of the world and the ungodly and turn the city of Sodom and Gomorrah into ash. The exact same references. You notice this? That Jude used and Paul used. Turning Sodom and Gomorrah into ash, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those afterwards would live ungodly. Once again, an example to us. Say God reserves unjust for the day of punishment, especially those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness. They despise and won't come under godly authority. That's one of the traits. People that do that, nobody can tell them how to live. I've got it figured out. Who do you think you are? I tell you what, we all need accountability. We do. It says they're presumptuous, they're self-willed, they'll receive the wages of unrighteousness, and they count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. There are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deception while they feast with you. The exact same reference that Jude made. He's saying they're feasting with you. They're in church. They're in fellowship. They're having potlucks with you. They're eating with you. And he's like, they don't feel bad at all. And it says that they have eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sinning, and they entice unstable souls. They specifically look for people that are struggling with stability in their life. That's who they target. Now, I want to say this. I want to be really clearly say this. I had some convictions this week. As you know, I worked at Teen Challenge, worked a lot of addiction. Um, this happens in some. Now, I'm going to say some, not all, because there's a lot of good churches out there, and there's some good suburb recoveries, but it happens in some suburb recoveries today. They're doing this exact thing. They're enticing people that are struggling with stability they draw weaker people that are struggling with sin. They're struggling with their fleshly desires. They're struggling with addiction. And then what they do is they'll come into that, and whether they're doing it on purpose or accidental, they'll begin to say things that are either false or incomplete teachings. They'll address addiction, but they almost do it in a way where it treats them not as a sinner but a victim. Now, when somebody, somebody's struggling with addiction, one, you want to have compassion for the way they were raised because maybe they had a bad upbringing. Maybe they had a traumatic experience. They might be using to help deal with depression, so what we call that is uh, self-medicating. Maybe they were abused. Like, you want to have compassion for all that. But what the Bible says for every single one of us, the gospel strips away every excuse, so I can't blame my dad, I can't blame my bad experience, I can't blame I lost my job, or whatever it is, that ultimately, at the end of the day, I've got to take ownership and say, okay, yes, those things were unfortunate, but I chose to sin. That's when people get free. But they'll begin to, to unpackage in a way that almost like you're a victim. It's not even your fault. In fact, it's called a disease. Does this resonate with any of you? But, it, but it's not. It's not a disease. It's sin. 
We want to love them. Or they'll, what they'll do is this. They'll come there, and these people are looking for help, and so they'll focus on addiction, but they'll ignore other sins. Sex before marriage, pornography addiction, anything that's not a chemical addiction, they'll ignore it because they'll focus just on sobriety. But the devil doesn't care what sin you're in bondage to. See, you can get sober and still go to hell. So what they do is they draw a lot of these unhealthy people in who are looking for freedom, are looking for hope. They entice them. This is what Peter's teaching. And here's what he says in the text. He says they'll do this. This is a promised liberty. They say things like, you know what? Um, they speak great swelling worlds of emptiness, and those that follow them are overcome with sin again. He's saying, hey, this is where you come to get set free. We love you. We have the hope. We're here for you. We care for you. So they'll say all these things. They'll say we have the answers. But here's the problem with that. Did you know that 75% of addicts are going to relapse? That's statistics. 75%. And here's the thing. That's not to mention those that don't relapse or the fact that the stats are skewed. Did you know that? So I'll give you an example. 75% are going to relapse. That's what they found statistically. But it's kind of deceiving because let's say you went in and you were a meth addict. Okay? You're addicted to meth. You get set free from meth, but now you're, you're smoking pot every day to self-medicate, and you're drinking, and you're an alcoholic. Well, according to the stats, you're still free because you're not using meth anymore. But are you free? No. no. And so what I found out when I worked at Teen Challenge, it became very discouraging for me, as if I'm being honest with you guys, because you're my friends, I'm going to be real with you. Um, I started finding that it was maybe 5% of those that were really set free who were actually loving Jesus, that weren't going back, that hadn't replaced one addiction for another. Very small percentage. And I think it's because we've actually tweaked the gospel. We've taught things that aren't necessarily true. And so they'll get set free, maybe, but they're still in other sins. And what happens? It's exactly what Peter warned. They get overcome in their addiction again. He's saying they'll say all these things that draw people and that sound so good, but they just caught up in their addiction again over and over and over because what do they need to be set free? Yeah. And Jesus said, truth will set you free. Peter continues, they have a hard training covenant practices. They are cursed children. They have forsaken the way, have gone astray, fallen the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was rebuked for his sin. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, whom is reserved the blacks of darkest forever, for whom they speak great swollen words of emptiness. So they say all these things. They make all these great promises. He said, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Well, they promise liberty. They are slaves of corruption by whom a person is overcome and brought into bondage. They make these great promises. They say things that sound so good. He said they're like wells without water. Now, for you and I today, water's not an issue. We got faucets. I can go to the gas station and get me a nice mountain water like Drinks are everywhere, right? But if you're in the Middle East back then, that's life or death. And if you saw a well in a distance, you're thinking, okay, that's life. I'm going to get water out of that, and I'm going to be fine. But they're saying that these people, here's what it is. They look good from a distance. Their ministries look good on the outside, and thirsty people are drawn to them, but they are wells without water. They're not bringing life. You know, it made me think of this, and here's the worst part about it, is when they go around and they say things to humor people and make them feel good but aren't totally honest, they make the Christians that are being totally honest look mean. Do you know that? When really the ones that are being honest are actually trying to love you and trying to help you. You see, this happened years ago. Do you remember the couple that we had here? Yeah, I, you know, I'll just say, you guys remember Rich? Man, up and down, in and out, we struggled, and we just sat and just, Sat in the office and said, man, we love you, we care for you, we're worried, the choice you're making, you're going to relapse, this is unhealthy. But they found another church, they'd go to another church and ours, and this other church would say, you're just a mighty man of God, you're just amazing, you're awesome, God loves you. And we're like, dude, we're seeing some real red flags in your life, and we're trying to help you, but no, none of that. You know, then it started to be like, you guys are just mean, Pastor Rob. And I'm like, not trying to be mean, I've just seen this pattern many times in people's lives, I'm trying to save your soul. You know how that story ended? In and out of prison, abuse. Then eventually suicide by drugs, and he died. 
And, and the worst part about it is that the end, it's not that they came back and said, well, Pastor Rob, you were right. You were just trying to give us truth. You're trying to save my husband's life. It was like, you're so mean. This is what's going on in America today, people. It's happening all the time. That's why he said we have to contend for our faith. So now listen, if you're not sure who Jude is referring to, listen to what Peter says in this text as I continue. Okay. It says, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. By the way, who escapes the pollution and the sin of the world through Jesus? There's only one type of person. Who's that? Christians. There's one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. So this is referring to people that have been set free. It said, If they are entangled again in sin and overcome the latter and is worse than the beginning. Do you hear that? He said, They escaped through Jesus Christ, but now the end is worse. They knew Jesus. They had the knowledge. They were set free, like Romans 6 said. But they're now overcome with sin, and they say it's actually worse for them than it was at the beginning. And he says this, it would have been better that they had not known the way of righteousness. He said it had been better that they never knew Jesus. Which is really hard because here's what I'm about to say. Some would say, well, that's just talking about your life on earth. I mean that their life's going to be messed up. They're going to use again, get caught up in sin. They might use their marriage and their job, but they're still going to heaven. Well, if that's true, I don't care if your life's destroyed. If you make it to heaven, you're pretty blessed. Amen? Amen. And yet saying here, it'd be better that they didn't even know Jesus. That is not a saved person, is it? No, it's not. And it says it happens according to true proverb, a dog returns its own vomit and a sow having washed a wallowing in the mud. Yeah. You know, time and time again, the Bible is really clear that we are saved by faith, nothing else. But true faith brings us regeneration. We're born again, and according to Jude 1.1, we get sanctified. But there are people that reject that teaching. See, they'll use grace to sin, but the Bible never uses grace as an excuse for sin. In fact, grace empowers us to live godly. And they say the opposite. And we have to contend for this because there's a lie out there and people are buying into it and they'll be lost forever. I want to share just a couple more quick examples to talk about grace. Hebrews 12 says this, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. And look carefully, lest anybody fall short of the grace of God. Lest any bitterness spring up, many become defiled, there's, that none of you become a fornicator or profane like Esau. For one morsel of food, for one worldly pleasure, gave up his birthright. Afterward, he wanted to inherit the blessing, but he was rejected, found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. And there's Hebrews chapter 10, says, if we sin willfully, and that's a key word, we all sin, right? But he's saying, if you're willfully doing it, he said, after we receive the knowledge of truth, there's no longer a sacrifice or sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation that devoured the adversaries. Anyone who's rejected the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two, three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will that person be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and come the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified a common thing and insult the Spirit of grace? He says it's actually insulting grace when you do that. And in Titus chapter 2 says this, that the grace of God that appears and has brought salvation to all of us, that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Here he's saying grace doesn't teach you to live in sin. It does the opposite. Grace teaches you to deny those things. So here's what we need to do. You have to contend for these people. There are people that are being deceived. It's almost not even their fault. They're told things that aren't true, and they don't know what they don't know. There's false teachings. There's false churches. Not all. There's also good ones out there too, amen? But there are people out there in churches that will hear me for size, for crowds, for money, for growth, whatever it might be, maybe for their own pride to feel good. There's a guy years ago that, that came to this church about 12 years ago, and he didn't come back because he said, I don't want to ever go to a church that addresses sin. What? What? It's a true story. And now he's part of the neighborhood church down the road because there they just make you feel great in your sin. Or, and and I, normally I wouldn't say this, but, you know, if this offends you, forgive me, but I'm just trying to be, do the best that I can. I used to listen to this guy, but Joe Losting. He's come out publicly and said this. He said, you know, people are just, they're so beat up. The world is so tough. He's like, I just feel like it's not my job. I just don't want to ever dress or talk about sin. 
But when I hear that, I think, wait a second, don't you care about saving souls in the gospel? Because they address sin. So what I'm hearing you say is you're more worried about their comfort on this earth but not their eternity. But there's a lot of people out there that will do this. They want to be entertained, make me feel good. And false teachings will inoculate people to the real truth. And then they'll start to look at those that are actually preaching truth as being unloving, while in reality, those preaching all of God's word actually are loving you and caring for you. So I'm going to leave us with this. It's from Esther. Esther 4.14. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom's sake for such a time as this. See, God placed Esther there for a reason during this season. And God placed you on earth during this time, not by accident. You are where you are on purpose. With your friends, your family, your coworkers, you have a mission. And it's contend for the faith and fight for truth so people can get set free. Because here's the thing. The people that have been bought into the lie or the deception that don't know better, they're not going to show up at healthy churches because they don't know they're being deceived. But they are in your lives. Please fight for them. Fight for truth. I believe that we're living in the end days. Anybody feel like that? And you are here for a reason. And you can make a difference. And you have to contend for the faith. And you have to fight for truth. You have a purpose. Amen? Amen. And I would get discouraged when I see what's happening. But I also see people who are still being changed. I see you. I see the hope. I see the fact that you can contend for others. And that makes me excited. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Father, we want to contend for truth. We want to do it in a way that's loving and winsome, that's biblically rooted, that's compassionate. But we must contend, Father. Give us the courage to do that. And Father, I pray that that courage to contend for others and for truth comes out of a place of a deep love for them and for the lost like you loved us and you've been patient. Father, help us to make a difference as the world gets darker. Help our light to shine even more brightly. So we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.